Hey everyone, it's uh, another Holiday Chat 2020. I'm being joined by D. How are you doing, D? I'm doing well. I'm happy you, to be here. I'm, I'm glad you chose to sign up. Uh, you want to give us a little bit ba of background on you so we have an idea where you're coming from? Sure. Um, for the last 10 years or so, I've been selling residential real estate in Ontario. Mm -hmm. And I have enjoyed that, but I'm ready for something different. And I guess for the last two years, I've been trying to get out of doing that and get into um, business buying, buy a business um, and coach people on, you know, maybe having, uh, getting to the point where they want to sell their business. So do more commercial real estate as opposed to residential and then parlay that into buying my own business. So, and what is it about real estate that you don't like? Is, is it the hours? Well, there's that. I mean, I have... I have really enjoyed it. I've had a great career. I've had a lot of really good families that I've worked with, but residential real estate is very taxing. Mm -hmm. The hours are extremely demanding. So there's that. And I just feel like for me, there's just too much uncertainty with residential real estate. Like you are, you're kind of always as good as your last sale and dependent on the market for sure. So if for some reason, you're selling in a city, let's say um, like Northern Ontario, where I was at one point where you're really dependent on the price of nickel and then the price of nickel drops and you have thousand people leave the city overnight in terms of contracts, the house prices just take a nosedive. And I mean, that has nothing to do with your ability to market and sell a property, but of course it's going to affect, you know, your ability to put food on the table. So it, after, seeing a couple of realtors that were well into their 70s still selling real estate and literally falling asleep at the table I just said this can't be my reality one day like I, I just won't do this um, into my 60s and 70s work like this keep up this pace and have really nothing to show for it because I don't have a pension mm -hmm. and um, that sort of thing so I just I started kind of like looking at it as more of a hamster wheel and then once that happened I really just wanted to get off of it so it's not that I hate residential real estate and I certainly really enjoyed the career that I had and the, like I said the families I worked with but I just see it now as a hamster wheel that I really want to just get off of. So you said you want to get into buying businesses and and I, I think it's an interesting way to express it because normally when I talk with someone who wants to buy a business, they say, you know, they, they have an idea of what kind of business they want to buy. Do you, have you sort of figured out what interests you? So initially I was somewhat sector agnostic. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have really a sector. I was more like the criteria, if it meets this, this, and this, then I'd be very interested in it. But then as I went through, you know, I started to kind of seeing that, in order to really close the deal and get myself over the finish line, I think I'm going to have to put the passion behind it and being sector agnostic for me just doesn't really work. So once I started really seeing like, okay, well, what are you passionate about? Then I started sort of narrowing down to more accommodations. So I started looking at like maybe a boutique hotel or motel. Okay. Um, and then I got really interested in um, mobile home parks, like RV parks. Um, and and, and then maybe like doing a roll up of buying several places. So what, when I say buying businesses, that's kind of what I mean, I guess. Okay. And okay. So, so how can I help you? What would, well, what would, I guess I, I, I want to have a chat with you about where you think I should put my efforts and how you see this happening. Like I talked to somebody um, not that long ago and he's very successful in business he owns a really successful company. I said, if you had to do it all over again, would, what would you do? He says, I would just flip land. I would just go about flipping raw land. Like that's a sustainable business model. And now I think about that and it's like, okay, well, so maybe I should do that. And I just seem like I have all of these things pulling me in different directions. And that's what I kind of need help with. Yeah. So, so it sounds like you're actually very entrepreneurial because this is something that that people have to deal with is that they see opportunities in all different directions. What is it about hospitality that attracts you? Um, well, I currently have a few little Airbnbs 
and I don't mind meeting people and I enjoy traveling myself. Um, so I like that aspect of hosting as well as, um, you know, being hosted. So that kind of thing. And I'm always interested when I go traveling to meet the hosts and talk to them about their experience and that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm interested in the accommodations from that sector, from that part of it. And I guess the other, like the mobile homes and the RV park, I'm interested in that part of it because I like the accommodations and I like the opportunity that that brings. And I see in terms of, from a financial point of view, affordable housing being such a huge opportunity. So I just think that that's really gonna just blow up over the next few years. So to me, mobile home park is housing versus accommodation. In, in, yeah. in my I, mind, and, accommodation is like when you're traveling. Yeah, and I guess like, I guess maybe I should reframe it, mobile home park or RV park, like a campground, yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. If it had a little motel attached to it or on the property, which I saw a lot of those in the States, unfortunately, before the whole coronavirus happened, you know, and then the, the world shut down. So I was seeing a lot of that in specifically Florida, you know, little motels on properties where you also have the ability to have some camping facilities and RV. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I'm, I'm familiar with that kind of property. I've seen a lot of those as well. Um, would you be more interested now in, in my mind, accommodations is kind of two different things. There's destination. People want to go somewhere because they want to experience spending time at that place, which would be more in line with your like RV park going someplace. And then there's other accommodation where people just happen to be traveling through and need a place to sleep. Are you interested in sort of curating or creating experiences for people? Yeah, I guess I would be, if you're asking me where my interests lie, it would definitely be in the first um, scenario that you talked about, okay. more of like a destination. I, I figure I don't live that far from Niagara. Versus and, an airport you know, hotel. Yeah, exactly. But um, but again, I think back, I think about like, is the right, right opportunity, depending on for your first deal, what should you do? Get something that's established or go someplace that's a little bit under the, you know, that has the potential to grow, but is maybe underdeveloped? It depends what your resources are. What are you working with? Well, I need to partner with somebody for the capital resources. I'm fully willing to work in the business. So like, you know, work for equity portion. Mm -hmm. I just don't know how viable or realistic some of those things are. Like, what would be the what would be the minimum, I guess, in terms of a financial amount that I'd have to bring to it to the table, regardless of what my partner looked like? Yeah. So in, in Ontario for a property like a hotel, if you were going to go to a lender, you might be getting 60, 65% financing. Okay. So then the question is, where does the other part come from? And the bank is going to require a certain debt to equity ratio. So it, it can't all come from the seller. It can't just be you know, a bank loan and then seller financing. There has to be some equity component and they might want it to be you know, 15, 20% maybe. And so the, when it comes to small business people, um, it's very difficult to access people who can make an investment. So let's say it's, uh, I don't know, what would be the price of this property, do you think, in the market that you're thinking of? Is this a million dollar deal or a $2 million? I would, I would say, I would say, yeah, I can't imagine that you'd be able to buy something that would be viable at this point for under a million. Mm -hmm. I would say like 1.2, 1.3 is probably realistic for a starting price point. Okay. So if we're going to say 1.3 million times, let's say you got to raise 25%, that's $325,000. Now, if you don't have any experience running a hotel, it could create a problem with the bank, but let's, let's ignore that, okay? For someone who's doing their first deal to go and approach people who are 
accredited investors who can sort of invest money with a stranger in a deal, you know, that doesn't have like a prospectus done and all that kind of thing. It's very, very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, what I've seen is that people in that situation, if they're going to raise any money from any kind of investors, it's going to be people from their own network. And it's going to be people who might look at the deal but ultimately their investment decision is going to be based on who you are. Okay. So I'll give you an example. Uh, did you ever see my mini storage mess video on YouTube? Um, I'm not sure. I probably did because I've watched most of the videos that you have. It's, it's pretty old. It's like from five years ago. Um, I saw an opportunity once to build a mini storage. And so I created a business plan and then I knew that I didn't want to use a lot of debt financing. Um, and so I talked with a lender and I talked with a couple lenders and I found a credit union who was willing to do the deal without any personal guarantees, but only up to 50%. And so then what I did is I called a whole bunch of people that I knew, and this wasn't a very big deal, but I had, I think I raised $87,000 for the other half mm -hmm. from eight or nine different people and they were all connected with me. So it was like 6,000 here, 12,000 here, 8,000 here, 10,000 here. And I set up a corporation. They all put the money in. We used part of the money to buy the land. Then we hired a builder. He surveyed it. He did everything. He applied for the building permit. And then we ran into problems with a city development plan. And the city put all these different caveats on us about the way that we had to plan it and build it. And we had to add all this stuff to make it look pretty, none of which would increase our revenue. And it just didn't make sense to do it anymore. And so we never ended up taking the loan and it was good because it meant we had no mortgage payment. And then we put the land up for sale and the whole thing unwound with me writing a check for 87 cents on every dollar that people had put in. So well, that's it, pretty good. Worked it ended out. up being a loss, but it wasn't that bad a deal, right? But most of those people were friends of mine from the Kiwanis Club. And so, so the, the question then is, if you're going to raise, in this example, 325000 do you have the, the people in your network who are going to be looking for something and what exactly is it that you're going to be able to offer them? And so then you have to figure out if these people are going to be equity investors in my business, Number one, what's in it for me? How do I get paid? So does D collect a salary as the general manager? And then the profits that are earned, what amount of that profit maybe is distributed to these shareholders? Or do you get them all under a preferred share where you own the common stock, you're the controller of the business, and they have preferred shares, which only start paying a dividend after the mortgage has declined to a certain LTV or something like that. Like, you have to figure out what the deal is going to be. And then you have to start talking to people. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, the, and the problem is that the thing that I had going for me when I did it is I knew that I could raise the money rather quickly because I had enough people that I knew had enough fun money around that they wouldn't mind kicking in six, eight, 12,000. And because I was building it, all I had to do was raise enough money to buy the land. And then I was in full control until I found out about the crazy city rules, right? The, the issue that you're going to run into is if you start talking to these potential investors about putting money in, then you have to find a deal. Or if you find a deal, you may not be able to convince a seller to wait for six months while you put this all together. Mm -hmm. That's, that's why you have to kind of prime the pump. You have to like build a, a, group of these investors by describing the type of deal that you're looking for. And then you have to go and try to find the deal. And then you have to work out an arrangement with the seller that you have a certain period of time with which to finalize your, your financing. And the banker who's going to do the, what they call the senior debt, the main mortgage on it, they're going to have to be on board with how you're organizing this. So is there a way to do this through um, a seller and have them carry most of the seller note and then basically 
they get, um, they can do like an earn out. Like if the, if let, let, let's say I buy a somewhat distressed hotel, not something that is just completely, mm -hmm. you know, death, uh, has absolutely no, um, revenue whatsoever, but let's say that it's underperforming and I buy this, um, is there an opportunity to pay the seller an amount, but then increase it if after a year or two, you know, it starts, it, we are able to increase the profits. Like, could I work a deal like that if I found the right oper property? Yeah. You don't even need a banker for a deal like that. So, so that kind of arrangement is just a deal between two parties. Let me, let me tell you about a motel deal that I did. So a guy came along and there found a motel that I had up for sale um, for my clients and the motel needed a lot of renovations. The, the first offer that the, and there was no mortgage on the property. The first offer that the buyer made was for hundred percent financing. The sellers weren't comfortable with that because they said, you know, we're handing over the deed to our motel and we're not getting any money and what happens if he fails, et cetera. Now, he had money, but he didn't want to give it to them. He wanted to use his money to renovate the property to make it better. So what we eventually ended up doing is there, there were two agreements. One was a master lease contract where he leased the motel from them for a set amount per month with the right to operate it and rent the rooms out to people. And the second agreement was an option to purchase at a fixed price. And so then what he did, once he had those two agreements, I think he had two years for the option to purchase. Then what he did is he renovated the property, got an appraisal for a much higher value. And then he was able to get a bank loan at like a 60 or 65% LTV, which gave him enough money to use exercise the option. Okay. So, well, I mean, like that sounds like that might be an option for me, especially if somebody has like owns a property free and clear and it's underperforming. Um, and then I'm able to, you know, go and I guess network with them, try and find something like that and do an option, option to purchase um, at our, uh, at a fixed amount. Yeah. The, the, the difficult thing about any of these deals, if, if you don't have your own cash down payment, is it all then hinges upon finding the right seller, which as, as you be aware, like that's, that would be like me trying to say, look, I need to buy a house in Ontario and I can't get a mortgage. So I have to find someone willing to finance me. I mean, maybe, maybe it could be found, but I'm not going to live in, you know, the best neighborhood. No, I mean, I, I understand what kind of challenges come with those opportunities, right? I understand what what sort of thing you'll be working with. But at the same time, I kind of look at it like that might be the the way to go about getting my first property. And then from there, uh, leverage it. Then I will have the down payment down the road to purchase another property. It's The first one is always the most difficult. Sure. You, you said you were doing some Airbnbs. Are these properties you own or? or yeah. So I have a, so about? I have a, a rental property and I, one of the units is Airbnb, but I did at one point have like four doors that I was managing and, um, and then I, I sold them and now I'm down to just one and I, I can have a second one if I want to, but I, I don't really have it operational right now because of COVID. Hmm. So, um, but yeah, so I have the experience that way. And I thought that might help because it has come up in the past in the, in the research that I've done and in the networking that I've done that, you know, if you don't have experience in the industry, you're really not going to be looked at very seriously. So that's about as much industry experience as I have. I, I don't know that I, it would serve me well to go and start a housekeeping job at one of these hotels to try and gain experience that way. But like, and the, yeah, I'm not sure if that's the kind of experience that they particularly are looking for. Right. You know? <laughs> I don't think that's going to do me any good, but you know, and I think that just being in, in, in um, residential real estate and I know I can sell commercial as well. I just haven't focused on that, but I do understand leases and I, and I do have a, a grasp of commercial, you know, uh, pricing and 
uh, per square footage, that sort of thing. So just to be able to um, have that experience, I think that has to count for something when I'm going in and talking to people as well. Like I, I can fairly easily evaluate a property. And I would say that that would go for a commercial property too, if I was in that space, like go in and assess what a hotel might be worth based on what they present me with their books, as well as the area and, you know, what they have to offer. I could do an analysis of what their, their business is worth and feel confident that my numbers are close to accurate. Like I would feel confident on my numbers. Right. Here's, here's the challenge is that when, when somebody wants to sell a business, their preference usually is to get paid like I've had hundreds of people tell me, I don't want to do any financing. It's only later when they realize just how difficult it is for buyers to get financing that they'll eventually agree to it and only for the right buyer. The difficulty in the hotel or accommodation space is you're talking about a real estate intensive type of business. And so the amount of financing available from the banks is much higher than what it is for most other businesses. And, and so there are buyers out there uh, looking for hotel properties, buyers with money. And so a property that is doing well, is successful, has got good cash flow, it's, it's not going to have trouble attracting the buyer who's going to be able to do the deal in a, in a traditional fashion, right? And so, so this, this really drives home the idea that it's, it's going to be off the beaten track it's, it's going to be something maybe that has some kind of performance issues. Um, I, you know, it, it, have you spent any time talking to any people, you know, who own these properties? Like have you ever, you know, called some motels that are in far off places and, and, and gauged what someone's interest is in, in selling? So I haven't done that specifically, but last year um, and b before the COVID happened, mm -hmm. I um, went and met with a seller who has had her business up for sale, a little motel uh, boutique property in Florida, and she's had it for sale for about two years. Mm -hmm. So what I gathered from the whole transaction, she really wanted me to buy her business, of course, but like the financing, the funding was a problem. So it's severely underperforming. Mm -hmm. She has another property that she actually lives at. This woman is 70 years old and has 20 something grandkids. So she's definitely checked out of the business, like completely. She has somebody who runs the other little motel for her, the one that I was interested in. The day that she met me at the property, she said, you know, it used to take me 45 50 minutes on a bad day to drive down here and now I'm up to an hour and a half I'm lucky if I can get down here in under two hours with traffic and I'm on the phone with my grandkids and they're asking me grandma why aren't you at our softball games yes. so I'm done and I'm I'm like I understand she's like I'm selling this property I'm not going to change my mind I am selling it and um, so I guess like the problem was is that she's asking three million dollars and she I, I, I think that it was, it was barely making, I think 11,000, it was barely making $11,000 per month. And what you would need to make would be about 13,000 just to cover the mortgage payments that you would have to strap on it at 3 million. And it was just like, there was just too much happening there to make it a viable option. And, and again, she was, she was willing to take all kinds of different scenarios, but wanted a big chunk of money up front, which I can provide. So what, um, so, so one of the strategies that we often explore with people who are in that kind of scenario where they're retired, you know, she's enjoying, she, I'm guessing she probably doesn't have a mortgage on it or if she does, it's quite small. She actually had. I don't know if she ran into some financial trouble or what brought about this, but she put a $1.4 million mortgage on this thing at 10% interest only. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that adds a little bit of a wrench. Oh no, I understand. I remember now what happened. So at some point, instead of sell it, she decided she was going to convert all of the um, hotel rooms. They're like mini apartments. She was going to convert them to condos. 
So she got everything approved and she went and upgraded one of the units to become, I guess, condo sufficient. Then she had to get all of the windows replaced to be hurricane proof. The Everything had to be up to a certain standard that it would be if you were buying an individual condominium as opposed to it just being a part of a hotel block. Mm -hmm. So she incurred, you know, up well over $250,000 in costs getting all of that done. And then, so now she says, you know, that's a huge benefit for the next person because at some point, if they ever wanted to convert this into a condo corp and then sell off the units individually, they could do that. I guess that would be an option down the road. But for right now, you know, she sort of wants people to pay for that ingenuity that she's put into place for the future. Um, but again, like the place isn't even performing enough to hmm. to cover what the mortgage payments would be once you, you know, like I said, if you paid her even close to her asking price. Yeah. So it it's an example of what I call dead capital. It's it's money that's been invested that earns no rate of return. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, so so that's a, I mean, that's going to be a problem. I mean, yeah, she, so, yeah, that would be my answer to your question. When you say like, have you met these people? Like I've gone out there and tried to network, but like you said, people are eager to buy well-performing hotels mm. and ones that are in areas where you get a lot of traffic or tourism, but off the beaten path, I don't know what the gauge of interest would be for somebody to carry a seller's note and, or to do, you know, deferred, a deferred payment because someone who wants to retire what they what they generally really want is they they need money to live on and so when it's it demonstrated that they can convert their hotel property into a stream of payments that they can live on then often that can be enticing um in one of the deals that i did um there was actually a it was a spring water business and the buyer, I'll probably screw up the numbers here, but the buyer offered like um, three something and said he wouldn't go beyond 400. And he was offering like half down and half with a seller note. And the seller came back and said he wanted 430, but only required 100 down. And he would, he would accept the balance over 10 years with 2% interest. And, and the buyer was like, well, that's more than I want to pay, but I can't get access to money that cheaply. And so he did the deal. And what, mm -hmm. what the seller wanted is the seller wanted a pension. He basically turned the business into an annuity. So he got a hundred grand down. He had some bills he wanted to pay, some debts to pay off, but he wanted that payment every month for 10 years so that he had money to live off of. Yeah, I, and I and I understand like that a lot of uh, burnt out retirees are looking for some kind of a scenario like that. I guess that's probably what I'm looking for too is to find that that retiree who wants to sell their business hasn't put a lot of of uh, anything has taken their foot off the gas pedal the last mm -hmm. few years because they don't really want to leave with a lot of business and loose ends. So, so, and then I would be able to step in. So I guess having gone over this with you, just one question before I move on to something else. Um, if they received, like if I did a deferred payment and they received, we'll say, you know, 25,000 a year for the next four years, um, would they, do they just pay the tax on the 25,000? They don't pay it on the full 100 until they've collected it, correct? So it, it depends how the sale is, is set up. If it's a, if it's um, an accountant can create something called a capital reserve where, where the capital gains get deferred until the cash is received. So it depends on the, on the type of sale if it's structured as a share sale or an asset sale and where, like which, if it's in Canada or the U S and so this is something that an accountant can help with. Okay, perfect. So that's, yeah, because that's one thing that I want to maybe get my head around a little bit better, because that would be an advantage, especially if you are selling, yeah, 
you know, a couple hundred thousand dollar business and you can get that over the course of a few years, then you're not going to be hit with that huge capital gains the first year. You can maybe defer out some of that. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, um, in, in fact, there was one of the students in the adventure group coaching program actually had a seller who at the last minute, it was a deal that just closed um, in the late fall at the last minute asked if he could leave some accounts receivable behind in the company in exchange for a higher purchase price because he wanted the buyer to collect the receivables and give the money to him in 2021. And it was exactly this. It was just mm -hmm. moving part of the money from one period to the next. Yeah. I mean, and I guess like if I am going after burnt out retirees or somebody retiring, it's not, it's not that far fetched that they would maybe be selling a secondary property too. Like if they're retiring and they're looking to dispose of, or they're, you know, like if they're looking to move to their cottage, they're going to sell their other house. Like they may have some other tax stuff that they're paying on. So they may want a shelter or defer a tax payment with their business. So I don't know, that's something, like I said, for me to get my head wrapped around a little bit better because it might be a, a, a pitching or a selling feature when I'm pitching myself as a buyer. Who knew it, having no money could sound so attractive if you put the right spin on it, right? Anything well, could sound so good if you church it up. At the, at the end of the day, this is what it's going to come down to. It's going to come down to them believing that you can pull it off. To them believing that you are a qualified operator. Well, like I said, the, the woman that I met with in Florida, she just kept going on. Like, I really want you to buy this business for me. Mm -hmm. She said, you know, D, of all the people that I've met with that have come here, you have asked the best questions. You've been the most serious about it. And I really see myself handing this over to you. And it was like, well, I really see myself buying it too. But it just didn't work out. Like the numbers just... I couldn't give her what she wanted. I think her numbers were just too far away from reality, right? So at this point, anyways, now- Well, a $1.4 million mortgage at 10% interest, that mortgage payment she has is eating up all that cash flow, isn't it? Well, exactly. 100% it was eating up all that cash flow. So there were some months where she couldn't even make the mortgage payment, you know, like she wouldn't even be able to make that interest only payment. Now, if she actually cared about the business and she was working in it, I have no doubt she'd be able to bring up her occupancy because there was one month where her occupancy was less than 25%. Like is, this during, is this during the COVID period or before you mean? Oh, no, this was before. Yeah. And I mean, they had some, uh, they had some issues with, um, I don't know if it's called red tide or some kind of tide issue that they had in Florida, which happened a few years ago. And it, and it did a lot of uh, harm to the businesses that were along the coast, but you know, everybody had that. And I looked at some of the other businesses and they were up over 35 and 55% occupancy where she was like, you know, like I said, maybe even 20, 23% one month. Uh, I just think she's totally lost interest. She yeah. completely checked out of the business. And it's like, if it makes, if it makes one dollar, fantastic, and if it makes five hundred dollars, even better. But she doesn't. She doesn't care. She's not worried about it at all. Yeah, she has no motivation. Yeah, I mean, she. I believe her. She really wants you to buy it, but she wants to get a check, right? She she wants. Yeah. To and I mean, I think that the guy that loaned her the one point four million would probably loan it to me. Like if he loaned it to her, I'm sure he'd loan it to me. It's on the building more so than it is on the business because look, she's not doing anything with the business. So it's, well, you know. Well, here's the, here's the problem is, is if you, if you take over that motel just by taking over the existing mortgage, she's getting nothing. Well, that's why it wouldn't work. And it would take me at least six months minimum to turn the place around that it would make enough mm -hmm that I'd be able to make the payment there as well as put money in her pocket and make it worth your while because you're not going to do all this just so that you can do it. You have to also eat, right? Well, you know, maybe you should be talking to the guy that holds that mortgage note because maybe you could work out a deal with him if he has to take it back. Uh, I mean, I guess that would be an option like, and, and she may, and, and I still keep in touch with her. So I may revisit it 
after the whole COVID thing. Right now with the way that the borders are and the difficulty in traveling, I don't think it's worth my while to put too much more effort into the U.S. just because there's too much uncertainty right now. And all that work that I did, really, it's not like it's all for naught, but really, in a way, it sort of is because it doesn't matter how close I was to getting something over the finish line, I didn't do it before everything closed down. And now I'm in a position where that's not a possibility. I can't just jump on a plane and travel to the States and just go have a conversation with the business owner and fly back the next day and then just, you know, come back here and meet with the banker. And it's not happening, right? So. So you understand though that you're very fortunate you didn't do any kind of deal before this happened. Well, I guess if if you say so fortunate, but I look at it like, well, if I owned a hotel, then maybe I would be parked there this whole time. But yes, yeah, fortunate because, you know, it's not the era to maybe own a hotel. <laughs> well, you know, you're talking about trying to find someone who is in a, a rough spot who needs to do a deal and there aren't enough buyers around, which forces them to have to consider some kind of creative opportunity. It would seem to me that the circumstances of this germ are creating what you need to find that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so 2021 might be the, the, like, let's think about this. I think that if you figured out what the property looks like as far as its characteristics, right? So Maybe it's, it's in a certain kind of community or on a certain kind of road or a certain number of units, right? And maybe you can start developing a, a list of these properties to start meeting people. Even if it's in Ontario, start sending out letters, right? Because the, the businesses can't be doing well. People aren't traveling. I know someone who works in a hotel here. They, they hit like 12 and a half percent occupancy this summer mm-hmm. where they're usually full. Yeah. So there's, there's gotta be people who are not doing well financially and they're, they're going to be looking for some kind of opportunity or there's going to be properties available from lenders if they have to take them. Yeah, I know. um, And that was kind of what I wanted to sort of get into was like, where do I go from here? What are my next steps? So you sort of laid it out, just identify the property that you would want to buy. What does it look like? Where is it located? And make a list of the properties that are within that catchment. Right. That fit that criteria. And so we kind of went from talking about finding investors to talking about motivated sellers who will do a deal that doesn't require any money. So let's, let's go back to that first thing. Because okay. when you create a plan, like let's say you identify a hundred properties like that. Well, then you can create a proposal where you can say, look, this is the, I want to buy one of these properties in all likelihood, it's going to have revenue in normal conditions around here. It's going to have earnings around here, kind of create a sketch of what this business might look like. The business is likely going to cost this amount. In normal times, post pandemic, you know, in the squeeze that's happening, maybe we expect to be able to buy them at a discount. Well, you know, now you can go and start to build that list of people who potentially might want to invest with you and present it to them as you going out to find an opportunity that is a great value because of the circumstances of the pandemic. And because the business is going to have to be rehabilitated and traffic is going to have to pick up, you can, it perfectly makes perfect sense to be telling these investors, you're going to have to put some money in for this acquisition and, and you won't likely be able to expect any kind of return or cash flow from it for several years. Because we're going to have to get traffic back up. We're going to have to get um, the occupancy back up. We're going to have to service the mortgage first. And it's only after we reach these goal posts that we're going to start to have some money flow to the investors. Now okay. you, you build something into that deal for yourself. Like some of the different things that I've seen over the years is that 
a certain percentage of the equity just goes to you because you're the one creating the deal. Uh, what's a realistic number for that? Like 5% or more? Well, no, I, I, I think it's going to be more be, because um, of all the work involved. Okay. Right. I mean, you could be working for many hours a week for a year and pulling this deal together. Yep. I'm just making notes here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, so you think that the percentage of equity would probably be closer to, I'm, I'm going to say like 25, maybe even 30% of the deal would be more realistic. So, so let's say you're going to buy a property for a million bucks and you had to raise 350, right? Mm -hmm. So what you might say is that you're going to sell shares in your company to your investors and 350,000 is going to be to raise 75%. So what that means is um, you have... 350,000 divided by 75. So every percentage point, so there's 75 of them that they're going to invest in is worth just under five grand. So if you said there's 100 shares, you give yourself 25 of them and you yep. sell the other 75 of them for $5,000 each. Okay. Yeah, that comes up to 375,000. So then you got... Your down payment, and you have a little bit of money for closing costs and things like that. Okay, right. and then and realistically, like when I'm pulling these people together that would do the um, that would do this deal that are investors looking to do something like this, should I be looking for, like you said, all of the people that you got for that one deal were from the Kiwanis Club? Should I be looking for various people, like a lawyer, an accountant, so different people that would be invested in the deal for like they would be invested professionally as well as for the opportunity or should I be looking for people that are just like, I just want into a, an opportunity. This one looks like something that I, you know, you're, where do I find these investors? You're going to have to find them through your own network because ultimately their decision is going to be based on, on you and their belief in you and how well they know you. And if they think you can pull this off. Okay. Right. And so in your experience with real estate, you've probably crossed paths with a lot of lawyers and other real estate agents. And, and under this scenario, if you really wanted to get 75 people together to put in five grand each, five grand is not a whole lot of money. The, the place where I would actually start is with the banker to talk about what you intend to do just to get an idea of what kind of bank financing they're going to be willing to do and how the pandemic is affecting their decisions in that sector. I can't imagine they're eager to make loans in that sector, but then you start running scenarios with them. You say, well, what if I could get a property for 20 or 30% less than it would have sold for in 2019? Mm -hmm. And then see what, what kind of requirements they're gonna have as far as um, your experience level, et cetera. Yeah, I know that right now the big five banks are really being very, uh, they're, not, they're not loaning like they were before, but I hear that the credit unions, some of them are still being quite reasonable. I guess that would all depend on which credit union you go to and where you're located, but I hear they're still being quite reasonable, but the big five banks are. Yeah, so what, what I can imagine is that a lender is, is going to not only look at the value of the building, but they're going to want to see what the capacity is for the owners to contribute more cash if business doesn't recover. So they, they might be looking for something like, yeah, we'll do a certain percent financing against the value of the property. And we want you to have a savings account with a year's worth of mortgage payments in it or something okay. like that, right? So that so they know that there's this buffer or the, the ability, you know, someone who puts in five grand to this deal doesn't want to have any kind of guarantee or requirement to put in any more money. That, that is where your interest, the interest of the investors and the interest of the bank would be in conflict. 
that deal I described to you, the mini storage deal, that was with the credit union. And mm -hmm. the reason why I needed to find how much financing I could get without personal guarantees is I knew that some of my investors who kicked in six grand weren't going to want to sign a personal guarantee of any kind. At the end of the day, I think they had to, but the personal guarantees were limited to the amount they put in. So if they put in six grand, their personal guarantee was for six grand, which okay. is radically different from the joint and several liability that bankers normally want from all mm -hmm. partners. They want everyone to be responsible for everything. Yeah, I've never actually heard of a personal guarantee for just the amount that you put in. Like, uh, I've never heard of that before, so. But the reason that that was even something we could come up with is because in a credit union, you actually have access relatively closely to the people who actually make the decisions. Okay. In the States, I see this with the regional banks, the small local banks, where the person you talk to probably knows the vice president who's actually going to make the decision. And yeah. so they, they can be a little more open to, to special accommodations because uh, it's not, the decision is not being made by a computer in the big city. Yeah, I understand what you're saying there. And I, and that's been my experience as well with the smaller, with the credit unions and small, like, you know, and the, the U S banks, the small little banks, yeah. you sometimes you talk to, um, well, I have anyways, I've talked to people, Americans and they talk like they have this, really intimate relationship with their bank or their banker and that, and that always strikes me as odd because in Canada like my experience has never been an intimate nice relationship with my bank like they describe so it's always a, just a funny thing you know they talk about like oh their local their local you know savings and trust and how they feel about them and the, how the way they treat them and stuff and I'm like wow <laughs> It's, it's competition, right? Because yeah. because in the states you've got like thousands of these banks competing. They they need to make their customers happy. In Canada, mm -hmm. there's what six banks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, right. And so it's so it, like I said, it's it's been a different thing when I've when I've heard people talking about that. And I and like I know that the credit unions are a little bit more uh, lenient as well as personable. You they, you know, yeah, I've had good experience with credit unions in the past when I've done business, even with real estate, with the clients that I've had going to them. So, mm -hmm. but the, the number one thing here is creating a pipeline of opportunities. Okay. Which is create is creating that sketch of what this property ideally looks like and then building a list of them so that you can actually start to create relationships. Okay. Because you, the, um, the people in my business buyer adventure group coaching program, they do prospecting where they're, they're making lists of in certain industries and they're reaching out to people. And the thing is, you never know what's going to happen. You can reach out to somebody who has zero interest in doing a deal with you. And then a, some kind of crazy personal circumstance occurs. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden now they're motivated. And guess what? They just spoke to someone who wants to buy a business like theirs. Mm -hmm. And so, so you can often get first crack at things before they even go talk with like a real estate agent or something. Yeah. That's happened so often in real estate, you know, uh, there's so many times where you, they, they, the people, they don't know that they're buying a house that day <laughs> until, until they talk to you. And then all of a sudden, you know, that night they're buying a house. They, in that morning, when they left for work, eating breakfast, they had no idea that they were buying a house that day. Right. So that just happens. It's circumstance. They get a come across something or they pass by a house on their way to work and they see it. And then next thing, you know, they give you a phone call. It's your name on the sign and boom, boom, boom. Like that happens all the time. So when you're saying that about just prospecting and you don't know what will fall out of the tree when you shake it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I mean, you, you could, I mean, you could contact someone and the owners just passed on and, and their family is not in a position to deal with it. And they realize it's not the time to sell a property like that because of the pandemic. I mean, you never know what kind of opportunities could come out yeah. of that 
Yeah, and I'm the, the one of the areas that I'm thinking of that I'm very interested in is right on the border. And there's a lot of Americans that own properties in this little town. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, this year with everything, they haven't been able to come over. They said they weren't even able to use their properties. Yeah. And I bought a piece of property years ago that was in a town similar to this. And uh, it was off of an American. And he told me that it was in his family since prohibition when they used to be able, when they used to come over to Canada to drink. <laughs> so they would buy, yeah, they bought up all these properties along the border, like between Ohio and Michigan and, and, you know, Ontario. And so that was, that was the thing. And he's like, so I always had all these such fond memories of coming over to Ontario. Cause it was always such a party, you know, to go over to Canada was always such a big party. And he goes, but then as you get older, like your kids, they don't have the same appreciation for it. And now his grandkids and his kids like had no, no time to go over, didn't care about it, didn't have the same kind of memories. So, you know, all that kind of stuff. So uh, this area that I'm thinking of this year, may be the perfect storm opportunity for me going into 2021 because of the uh, lockdown that we've had or the uh, in a, inaccessibility at the border. Mm. Could vote in my favor. Yeah. I mean, I've seen the same thing here where I am. Like there's a lot of cottage properties here that are owned by Americans. They weren't allowed in. Uh, mm -hmm. Even people from Ontario and stuff. It was, we were into July before they allowed people from other provinces to come in here. And then yeah. they required them to isolate. So I've personally heard of a lot of my dad's friends who owned condos and other similar properties down in Florida who've sold them because they, they don't anticipate being able to, like they, their time was cut in half last winter. They had to rush home in March. And then it didn't look like they were gonna be able to go down this winter. And so they, some of them, these guys have sold, these Canadians have sold properties down in Florida because now, you know, a few months ago, they, there wasn't even a talk of a vaccine. So they're like, how many years am I gonna pay maintenance on this place that I can't even go to? Yeah, I've uh, experienced that myself in my own family with different family members. And I, for even for my family that's traveled before this happened, as they get older, the cost of insurance was always such a huge thing. And now with this whole coronavirus, like if they say that even if you're able to travel, you're, they will exempt you from insurance, anything to do with that. If you get, let's say you break your arm, but you also have COVID at the same time, are they going to drop you completely? Like, for most people, I would say the cost of what it what it is to get anything done in the States, they just wouldn't chance it. If you don't have coverage and you don't have, you know, they just wouldn't travel because it would be so costly if something happened, right? So that's going to prevent a lot of people. Like, they, like I said, it just could be the perfect storm this year for the right opportunity. And, anyways, I guess. and, and, and here's the thing is long-term, everyone pretty much agrees things eventually will go back to normal. And so it's, it would be the right time to be talking to people about, Hey, I'm going to look for this opportunity to get this kind of property at a discount where it'll make sense. And it'll be one of these long-term home runs 10 years from now, we're all going to go, wow, we, we made a good deal for ourselves. And so the question that you should be asking is who in my network would want to do business with me, would have access to some money that they'd be able to put in and not miss, right? Because it could be very many years before you're able to give them some kind of return, or they, you might even have to wait until you go on and sell the property to someone else before they get their payday. Yeah. Right. But it could be a very lucrative thing. And so there are, could be, could be people that are going to be interested in that kind of proposition from you, but it's going to be about you. They're going to look at the business and look at the property, but the decision is going to be about you. Okay. I, I understand that. Um, based on the two scenarios that we talked about with the investors, pulling that together and trying to find a group or a network of investors, we're trying to find a seller who's willing to sell or finance a deal. What would you say would you think is the best chance of getting something over the line? Where I'd should I focus my efforts? I'd be working on both because the 
the one thing that we haven't talked about is what if there's no opportunity for a mortgage? Uh -huh. You might end up with getting whatever you can raise from your investors and having the seller finance balance, effectively both of these things. And then there's no mortgage. And so then maybe you run the place for a few years and then you're able to get a mortgage and, and maybe pay out the, the seller at that time and maybe free up some money that you could use to give to the investors too. Okay. There, there's always going to be an opportunity to use cash in a deal. So, so trying to build a group of investors that want to do something like this with you is something that I think, I don't think you can lose by doing it. I mean, it's going to cost you your time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's where, so you think I should do both? Yeah, because, because you, you want to, you want to build the list of pro prospects so that you can then have an idea of what you're going to be saying to potential investors. Because if you talk to someone about this idea, they're going to say, well, what kind of property are you going to buy? And you say, well, here's a list of a hundred of them. And here are these mm -hmm. common characteristics. And this is what I think I can do. And before you put your money in, you're going to see the actual property. But I'm looking for people that are going to raise their hand and say, yeah, if you find a deal like you're talking about, I want to do this. Okay. Okay. And I mean, you understand none of this is easy. Mm -hmm. It's all I know, I know that it's a, a lot of work. If it was easy, everybody would do it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is really good. This has been very helpful because um, I have made a lot of notes here and I have a very clear vision of what I need to do next, which is start by creating my my vision, my avatar. Mm -hmm. What does that perfect property look like? And then go about trying to find uh, the people surrounding those that perfect property. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck, Dee. Let me know how it goes. Thank you so much. And thank you for your time tonight, David. No Have problem. A Merry Christmas. Thanks, you too. And, uh, and best of luck. Thanks.